Good evening. Welcome back. Glad you made it out. We're going to start this evening singing about the old rugged cross. <clears throat> God bless you. Be seated. Glad that you're here. And uh, we have very few announcements tonight, uh, but we need to be praying about some things and for some things. Welcome everyone that's on live stream. I saw this morning that we had uh, on Facebook, we had 20 people viewing uh, this morning. I don't know about YouTube, Didn't, couldn't get a number there, but uh, I think the number is increasing a little bit. Very thankful for that. Uh, we'll mention it in the message tonight, uh, but uh, when, when one door closes, another opens if we're not so busy watching the closed door that we miss the open one. And so, and when God closes the door, no man can open it. When God opens the door, no man can close it. And so we need to be thankful for that. Think about some of those things. Glad that you're here tonight. Glad for everyone that's watching. And then uh, make this mention, 7 o'clock Wednesday, ask you please to... Uh, Make that a matter of prayer. We used to call Wednesday night services the hour of power, and I believe it's important that we get together in the middle of the week, kind of check each other out and, you know, kind of put the Band-Aids on and, and uh, fellowship a little bit and listen to people's stories and, and try to be an encouragement and help one to another. I think it's more important than what we sometimes realize. The 19th through the 21st of March is our missions conference. We're very glad for that, very happy for that, happy, happy to have the 
Winter's family coming in with us, a man and wife and three children, ages, I believe it's three, seven, and ten, and we'll have a good time with them, already looking forward to that. And then uh, on the 4th of April, Easter, another good time to invite folk to come and to be with us. The Rollins won't be with us tonight. They said that they'd be watching on live stream, uh, but uh, because of the weather and the, pre the prediction of uh, mixed pre precipitation, and I, so we don't know if that's snow and ice or if it's rain and ice or if it's just fog and water. I don't know what it is, but it's some kind of mixed uh, precipitation and uh, participation of more than one product in the precipitation, I guess. Don't try to say that fast, amen. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but they're watching on live stream and glad of that. It's, it's not mandatory that you let us know when you're not gonna be here, but uh, it helps us to know, you know, if you're sick, you've had an accident, maybe you're partway here and didn't make it and so forth. So I'm glad that Brother Rollins took the time uh, to call. Uh, they've been so faithful since Brother Oaks, a number of years ago, invited them to come, and they did, and they did, and they do, Amen. and they're very thankful for that. So you never know what will happen when you invite someone to come. My son mentioned that they've been going out and seeing some of the same people over and over and over. He said, I get so tired of hearing people uh, give excuses for why they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So uh, when we went on visitation last time, he said, uh, we decided to go and hear no from a person we never heard it from before. <laughs> and so they went out to see some other people, some different people. So maybe we ought to kind of stretch a little bit and go give the gospel to someone we haven't given it to before and uh, start breaking up the fallow ground and busting up the clods and planting some seed and watching, see what God would do. Remember to keep praying for these people. Miss Alex's sister, uh, Deborah. No, no, it's not right. Diane, excuse me, and then brother, brother Smith's brother, Ralph, and then Miss Vicky's sister and, and her daughter, and Brother Leslie. Pray about those tests coming back and pray for his dad, Brother Johnson, and then certainly pray for America. We need, we need, we need to pray uh, for our nation. You don't turn on any newscast before, it, but what you see something that just kind of, it just kind of excites you in a difficult way. I was looking at some things. We got ready, getting ready to go to church, and I finally just turned my phone off. I told Miss Judy, I said, I don't need to, to listen to that, to watch that, to hear that, and then go try to preach the gospel. I can still preach it, but I might not have the right attitude while I was doing it. So I'm sure glad you're here tonight. Looking forward to a good night in the house of God as we uh, look at the Word of God and some things I think are very pertinent to help us uh, today. A lot of things we can't do from this pulpit but we can, with the energy and the help of God, prepare a people to meet their God. And that's what we want to do. That's what that first Baptist did. And that's what Jesus has asked us to do. Win people and then prepare them to meet their God. God bless you. Brother Weaver, come pray for us tonight, please. Sir. Father, uh, we thank you that we have the, the freedom and the ability and the health to be here tonight. Uh, Lord, um, there are many that are... Um, members and friends and um, those associated with Bethel Baptist Church, Lord, that uh, can't be here or aren't here for various reasons. And uh, Lord, we just uh, lift them up before you. And uh, Lord, particularly those uh, struggling with some various health issues. And uh, Lord, you know the list that was just read. And um, Lord, we just continue to lift them before your throne, recognizing that you are the great healer. Lord, apart from you, there is no healing. Uh, Lord, uh, examples in the scriptures of people spending all their wealth on, on doctors only to find out that the Lord Jesus was the healer. And uh, Lord, we, we uh, just lift them up before your throne and, and ask you to touch their bodies. And Lord, in the midst of it, Lord, would you just encourage their hearts? Lord, you help them to look towards you. Uh, Lord, to see your hand at work in their lives and in those around them. And uh, Lord, would you just allow them to still be a bold witness in the, in the midst of trials and tribulations. And Lord, may we be found faithful in praying uh, for them. And uh, then just continuing, as Pastor mentioned, to be reaching out to, to the lost around us. And Lord, uh, uh, this week, Lord, would you open our eyes and show us uh, who the next person is we should be sharing with. And then, Lord, would you choose in your kindness to deliver some from the path of hell. And, uh, Lord, would you draw uh, people to Christ. And, uh, Lord, would you just use us as, as your witness. 
Lord, we lift up the message uh, to you tonight, uh, trusting that the Holy Spirit is, is a, a prompted pastor and, and is sharing scriptures with us. Lord, that we would be attentive to it. Lord, that this service would be, it would be yours. Uh, Lord, that the remainder of the, the singing and, and the prayers and the, the preaching and the fellowship, Lord, that it would all bring glory and honor to the, our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you'll stand again, please, and let's sing about our Redeemer. <clears throat> and his wondrous love to me. be seated if you can after that and we do have a special tonight Nathan's got a special for us on the piano Ninety and I just wanted to read the passage real quick that this uh, this story comes from Luke 15 verse 4 through 7 says, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he does lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over 99 just persons which need no repentance. But 
the shepherd made answer this of mine has wandered away from me and although the road be rough and steep I go to the desert to find my sheep I go to the desert to find my sheep but Oftentimes, thank the Lord for the music that we have at Bethel Baptist Church, and if you haven't, uh, you ought to. Uh, it's important. It really helps uh, with the ministry of God's Word, and I believe it's a gift from the Lord, and we ought to appreciate it, and so praise the Lord for good music. Whenever someone's singing a special or doing something, I kind of peek around the edge of the corner and watch my wife. She's a pretty good barometer on how things are going. And uh, sometimes she almost gets levitated. But uh, I appreciate that. Take your Bibles tonight, if you will, please, and go to the gospel. No, excuse me, to the book of Daniel, chapter number one. Daniel, chapter number one. <clears throat> and we're going to begin reading in verse number one, and uh, we're going to read 21 verses of this chapter because there's just things all through here that have to do with what we want to make mention of tonight. The title of the message tonight is The Charlie Brown Syndrome or Victim or Victor. And uh, I think there's too many Christians today running around with the Charlie Brown syndrome. We'll make more mention of that a little bit later, but let's go to the Word of God. This is certainly the most important thing that we'll do tonight. The Bible says, beginning in verse number 1 of Daniel chapter 1, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Aspenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well flavored, flavored, no, not flavored, favored, 
and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily portion of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end of that thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and unto Hananiah the name of Shadrach, and unto Mishael uh, of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine that which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why should he see your faces worse likening than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, prove thy servant, I beseech thee, ten days, and give them, uh, excuse me, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat the portion of the king's meat, and as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and approved them ten days, and proved them ten days. At the end of the ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Then Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. As for the four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had appointed he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them, and, upon, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and the astrologers that were in all his, his realm. And Daniel continued even into the first year of King Cyrus. What a wonderful story. We read that story and remember it well, and it excites us to see God working with these young men. We need to understand some things today by asking ourselves this question. Why is it with trouble? When trouble comes into li uh, life, uh, what defeats one person, what, what problem totally destroys their attitude and their actions, at the same time can work in another person's life to almost make them shine, almost make them better, almost improve upon them. I heard a story of, of uh, two men that went to an island as shoe salesmen. They were going to sell shoes on this island. And when they got there and they made their, their uh, survey trips around the island, one of them went back and immediately sent word back to his office, his home office, please get me out of here. No one here wears shoes. We can't sell anything here. And while the other one was leaving the message and said, send all the shoes you have. Everybody here needs them. You know, what, what do we look at? You know, two men look through prison bars. One saw mud and one saw stars. What, what, are we, what are we looking at? I'm convinced today that too many people are giving up too easy and uh, uh, not looking where the problem really is. You know, it's easy to make an excuse. We read in the Bible of men that made an excuse. One bought some land. One had some oxen he hadn't proven. And, and the last one, I like this guy, he'd married a wife and therefore he couldn't come after probably telling everyone downtown that he was a boss in his house. I love it when I invite somebody to church and the man says, <clears throat> well, I'll have to check with the little lady. My goodness. You're just telling everybody how you went and bought a bass boat and didn't talk to her. And you went and bought a new shotgun and didn't talk to her. And you went and made a trip that you didn't even tell her about and spent a bunch of money. Come on now, get real. 
We all have an excuse to make, and an excuse usually is the skin of reason. I mean, it looks pretty good, but it's stuffed with a lie. There was a song years ago, and I mentioned this to Miss Judy this morning, and she said, they'll never even know it. But it doesn't matter if you know it or not. If you listen real close, you'll get the gist of it. It's about a fellow who always had an excuse. Listen, it's called Charlie Brown. Fee, fee, fi, fi, fo, fo, fum. I smell smoke in an auditorium. Charlie Brown, Charlie Brown. He's a clown, that Charlie Brown. He's going to get caught. Just you wait and see. Why is everybody always picking on me? said Charlie Brown. Well, that's him on his knees. I know that's him. Yelling seven come eleven down in the boys' gym. That's Charlie Brown. That's Charlie Brown. He's a clown, that Charlie Brown. He's going to get caught. Just you wait and see. Why is everybody always picking on me? Who's always writing things on the wall? Who's always goofing off in the hall? Who's that always throwing spitballs? Yeah, guess who? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, who, me? You, Charlie, you. He walks in the classroom, cool and slow. Who called the teacher, the English teacher, Daddy-O? Charlie Brown, Charlie Brown, he's a clown, that Charlie Brown. He's going to get caught, just you wait and see. Why is everybody always picking on me? That's America today. We always have an excuse. Now let me give you some biblical truths. Job chapter 5 and verse number 6 says, Although affliction cometh not forth of the dust, neither doth trouble spring out of the ground, yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. Job chapter 14 and verse number 1 says, Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of troubles. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Oh, what a wonderful statement. God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. And 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the Devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Wise men have said something about opportunities missed and opportunities not seen. A fellow by the name of Alexander Graham Bell. Anybody use a telephone today? Alexander Graham Bell was a, one of the forerunners of that, and Boy, he'd probably die the death of a rag dolly today if he saw the phone as it is today. But here's what he said. When one door closes, another opens. But as we often long so look and so regretfully upon the closed door that we do not see the one which was opened for us. And then a fellow by the name of Charles Lindbergh. Success is not measured by what a man accomplishes, but by the opposition he's, in, he's encountered and the courage with which he has maintained the struggle almost against overwhelming odds. And then a fellow by the name of John Maxwell said, the Lord chooses the way we go and, excuse me, the Lord chooses what we go through and we choose how we go through it. What a great truth. Now, as we consider these young men that we read about tonight, let's notice some things. First off, they were victimized by another nation and foreign individuals. They could have cried anything they wanted. They could have cried racism. Uh, they could have cried whatever they wanted to cry. They could have. They lost absolute control of the land where they had been raised. Total, total loss of that, of that land. And they could have been asking themselves the question, well, I wonder who's, who's farming the back 40 now. I, I wonder if that rock wall ever got finished. I wonder about the, the tree that we planted over there by Grandma's grave. I, I wonder how that's doing. But you see, that was all gone. 
all gone through no fault of their own, all gone. And then they could have been asking the question, well, I wonder what they're using it for. Uh, they're probably not using it now to glorify the Lord. They probably, they're, they're probably not running cattle and sheep. Uh, they probably got hogs in there or something. And, and they had all the excuse in the world of becoming downtrodden, disheartened, and a victim of things that didn't concern them other than the reproach of it. They lost control of their lives. Several times in the portion of Scripture, I think five different times in the portion of Scripture we read, the Bible talks about the prince of the eunuchs. These young men, probably 17 or 18 years old, had been castrated so that they could be trusted with the royal women and they wouldn't be running off and doing things they shouldn't do. It would change their attitude about some things. And uh, if you remember in Acts chapter 8, Philip was sent from a great revival out on the, to the desert in Gaza and he comes up into the, the, the chariot and begins to talk to this man from Ethiopia. The man also was a eunuch. And uh, he had this question. He says, who shall declare his generation? Speaking of the Lord Jesus, Isaiah says that he was cut down. Of course, left no children. Who shall declare his generation? That's the thing that caught his attention. And yet we find that evidently that didn't sway these boys. These young men that served the Lord Jesus, loved their God and loved their nation, loved their parents. They didn't, they didn't because they lost control of their lives, didn't give up. They lost control of their loyalties. No more could they sing the national anthem, whatever that was. I can't imagine being placed at a place where I couldn't sing, Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light. But they were. They were. And I, I, can't, I can't imagine being placed in a place where I couldn't put my hand on my heart and say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. But they were. They were. They had been victimized by a nation and victimized by individuals. They lost control of their loyalties. They lost control of their lives. They lost control of their land. And then they lost control of their liturgy, the way that they worship. They couldn't sing a song, have a song service like we had today. They couldn't listen to preaching like we do anytime we want to. They didn't listen. They couldn't, couldn't pray like the, openly and, and honestly before people like we do. They had been victimized. But you'd never know it from, from re recorded history. You'd never know that for one second they felt sorry for themselves. Amen. Not one second. And then they were victorious over all these things. In verses 1 through 8, actually we'll drop down to verse number 8. The Bible says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat nor with the wine that he did, uh, which he did drink. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. You see, he, he didn't let go. He didn't say, well, I'm in a bad place, and mom and dad will never know, and the nosy neighbor around the corner, she'll never know, and, and news will never get back to the... No, none of that. None of that. He purposed in his heart, and so they didn't let go, and then they didn't let up. Verse number 9, actually, you read, read now a whole lot of verses, but verse number 9 says, now they had brought Daniel into... Now God had brought Daniel into favor, tender love, and um, excuse me, God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the princes of the eunuchs. And he, he didn't let up. And the prince of the eunuchs saw him and saw in him an example of godliness, an example of honesty, an example of character. He saw in him all those things. And then they, they didn't let down. Verses 12 and 13, the Bible says, prove thy servants. You see, they didn't, they didn't say, well, we're here, you know, and it's not going to make any difference. We can't make any difference. There's nothing we can do. They didn't say that. They said in verse number 12, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee in the countenance of the children that eat the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. They simply refused to become bitter. They refused to become victims. They were victors. For the cause of Christ. Now we could ask ourselves the question, how is it, 
How is it that we can do the same thing? How can we have that kind of victory? And I think there's some real answers here as we go through this portion of Scripture. First off, they recognized who was in charge. You see, the Bible says in verse number 2 of our text tonight, the Bible says, and the Lord gave. And the Lord gave. It may come as a surprise to you while you're wallowing in your sorrow and wallowing in your pity me. It may come as a, as a shock to you as a child of God, but God knows right where you're at. And God's given you a grade that you might not want to face when you step out into eternity. In Romans chapter 8 and verse number 28, we know that verse. The Bible says, we know that all things work together for them that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose. You see, God, God knows everything that's happening. I remember standing at the back of a chapel class in Colorado Springs and two preachers had come over and we'd have special guests to come into our chapel services and sometimes the uh, neighboring preachers would come in and listen and enjoy it and would fellowship, sometimes go and have a meal together and so forth. And two preachers and I were standing at the back of the auditorium and we were visiting about some things and they were talking about Romans 8 and verse number 28. And uh, one of them said this, he said, I understand that to mean this, that I'm behind the hand of the Lord and he's protecting me and not one thing can get to me without passing through the permissive hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know he loves me. And that verse tells me that anything he lets come through that hand to me is for my good and for his glory. Amen. It'll make me more like Jesus if I accept it as a gift rather than thinking that God hates me and therefore he sent it to me. You see, these men never forgot who was in charge. Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 12 says, But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. Amen. The Lord, uh, we, we find here that Paul is, is talking about all the things that happened, the shipwrecks and, and the stonings and the imprisonment and, and the beatings uh, and all the things that happened to him. He said, but listen, don't, don't misunderstand that. Everything that's happened to me has happened for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They knew who was in charge. One of my favorite Bible characters is Joseph. Joseph was me lined by his brothers. He was forgotten about by everybody. He was, he was forgotten by the baker and the, and the butler for a long time. And, and just one problem after another, betrayed by Potiphar's wife, all those things. And when his brothers think he's about ready to try to get even, he said this, but as for you, you thought it evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Oh, how we need to understand today that when things come into our life that we would personally think, I'd rather this didn't come. Understand this. Understand who is watching. Understand who's overseeing. Understand there's a reason. It's not, it's not just happening because. There's a reason, and God has orchestrated things, and God has worked things. I sometimes fantasize in my mind about all the different things that God had to do to bring someone to my door and knock on my door to give me the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if I can fantasize about that and enjoy thinking about that and dream about that and imagine all that, why can't I do the same thing when God allows trouble to come down the road and knock on my door? God is still in charge. And God loves me more now that I'm his than he did when I was his enemy. And I know he loved me then. And so we find that these men recognized who's in charge. The second thing they did is they rested in the truth. They rested in the truth. In verse number 8, the Bible says, but Daniel purposed in his heart. There was a young lady who found herself in a bad situation. And... Uh, uh, it was that uh, they were going to slay all the Jews in the kingdom. All of them were supposed to die. And her uncle told her that she ought to go in and see Artaxerxes the king. And she said, but I, I can't. 
And he gave her a little bit of talking to and told her that life is bigger than her and more important than her. And maybe you were born for such a time as this. And that's certainly a, a uh, poor uh, quoting of that verse. But this isn't. In chapter 4 and verse number 16, she said, So will I go unto the king, uh, which is not according to the law, and if I perish, I perish. And she just gave up. She rested in the truth. She said, I'm going to do all that I can do and trust God for the outcome. Amen. And how we need to do that. 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse number 7. We mentioned the four leprous men that were in uh, Samaria and the Syrians had surrounded the city and all kinds of trouble were there. People were starving to death. And they said, hey, we've got an idea. Let's, let's go out to the Syrians and... And if they, here's what they said. He said, uh, we shall live. If they let us live, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. We talked about that not very long ago. And they said simply this, we're going to rest in the truth. The truth is, if we stay here, we're going to die. The truth is, if we go out there, the only thing that can happen to us is we die. Here we die, there we die, but the, we're only going to die. That's the worst thing that can happen. If we go out there, something better might happen, and certainly it did. You know, our country is, is blessed because we've had men and ladies who were willing to step out by faith and do things just because of love of country. Many of them, I think, even love country more than they love God. But still, they were moved by a, by a truth. Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. Not very many politicians saying that nowadays. Nathan Hale said, I regret that I have but one life to give for my country. Oh, I know there's, there's myriads of military people that would, would embrace that thought. But what about us? What are we willing to give for the country we're going to? What are we willing to promote for the country we're going to? What are we willing to suffer for the country that we're going to? What price? Are we willing to pay? They rested in the truth. And then thirdly, they resisted ungodly pressures. In verse number 10, we find that the, the uh, uh, prince of the eunuchs, when Daniel tried to talk to him, he said, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why should he see your faces worse likening than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head. So here they, they, were, they were resisting ungodly pressure. Listen, if you make up your mind you're going to live for Jesus, the devil's going to figure out how to put ungodly pressure against you and try to make you back up on your promises and on your vows. Getting ready to go to the mission field and someone says, you've got to think of your family first. Getting ready to do something great for God. You hear the voice of the Lord and you're surrendering to do what God wants you to do. And someone says, well, you, you better think of your family first. And they might be very sincere. They might be very honest in their opinion of that. But we need to be able to resist ungodly pressure as they did. Someone says, if you do that, you're going to starve to death. If you do that, you're going to starve to death. Yes, sir, just like the young lad did when he brought his lunch to the Lord Jesus and took home 12 baskets instead of a little lunch. You know, uh, somebody will say, well, if you don't, if you don't uh, submit to the pressures that people put on you, you know, uh, when my wife and I got ready to go to Austria, I thank God that my mother, well, she was a little objectionable for a little bit, but she came to the place where she said, whatever God wants you to do. And my father-in-law, who was also a very good friend of mine, he said, Preacher, I want you to do what you think God wants you to do. I said, I'll miss you, and I wish you were here, but I want you to do what God wants you to do. Makes it so much easier to serve the Lord when you know people that you love or are uh, maybe concerned, but at least wanting you to do what God wants you to do. Somebody says, what will the neighbors think? Better think about what God's going to think. I'll never stand before my neighbors and give an account for what I've done in my life. But I will one day stand before the Lord Jesus. And you know, if there, were, if there were no judgment down at the end of life, 
just the conviction of the Holy Ghost of God when I've done something that I shouldn't do, when I have yielded to a pressure that is ungodly, no matter how meaningful it is. Listen, no matter how meaningful it is, if it's contrary to this book, it's ungodly. And we need to understand that. They resisted ungodly pressure. The mother of Moses is an example of resisting ungodly pressure. The king put out word, any boy that's born, kill it. Any child that's born a boy, kill it. And she looked at the child and she said, I can't do that. And so we see her in the scriptures. She's making a bassinet and she's making it waterproof with slime so that she can cover the boy and put him into the Nile River as she simply, simply resisted ungodly pressure. The next thing we find is they relinquish the time frame to the Lord. In verse number 15, the Bible says, and at the end of 10 days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh. They had, they had this 10 day thing, but we, we get the idea that we can tell God how soon he has to do something for us. We, we, get, we, get the, we have this idea somewhere, we picked it up to say, well, God, uh, by the first of next week or by the 15th of next month or, or whatever, and we need to understand that we're not supposed to be able to tell God how much time he has to do something. If he's God, he's God. When uh, Daniel prayed, and God didn't answer him in a timely fashion, he sent an angel to apologize to Daniel for him having to wait. I think we can trust God with time. Yes. Listen about time. God can stop time. You remember when Joshua was battling in the valley, and he said, Lord, we've almost got these guys whipped. If we just had a little more time, And then he said, son, stand thou still. God can stop time if he wants to. God can add to time if he wants to. You remember what he said to Hezekiah? You want the sun to go down 10 degrees or you want it to go back 10 degrees? And Hezekiah said, it's going to go down 10 degrees regardless of what I say. Let's see it go back 10 degrees. And God caused it to back up 10 degrees and give him more time. God can reverse time. God can change time, and God can change people in time. And so they simply relinquish the time frame to the Lord. Isaac was born according to the time of life. When Abraham was told that his wife's going to have a child, Sarah was in the tent having prepared a meal for these fellows, and the Lord Jesus, I think, in a in a Old Testament appearance of the Lord. And uh, the Lord said, uh, according to the time of life, Sarah's going to have a son. And uh, Sarah started laughing. And that, incidentally, is the reason Isaac is called Isaac. Because every time he introduced himself, they said, laughter? What, would, what parent would name you laughter? He said, well, my mama did because when God promised her that he was going to give me to her she laughed and so God said okay just call your boy laughter don't don't try to put God in a box God you don't have a box that God can fit in he can fit in your heart but he can't fit in a box and then in Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 4 after praying for the Redeemer to come and praying for the Redeemer to come and praying for the Redeemer to come The Bible said, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, one of a woman made under the law to redeem them that are under the law. Oh, how we need to understand today, they relinquished the time frame completely up to God. And then they remained consistent in their living. In verse number 21, the Bible says, and Daniel continued even into the first year of Cyrus the king. Oh, uh, excuse me, King Cyrus. And so they weren't wishy-washy, but they were like Jesus. The same yesterday, today, and forever. They just, they just continued. They, they just continued. Same song, next verse. Just kept on going. 
I know people today that they, they change, they, they go up and down like a window shade. They, they change their mind and their opinion and their doctrine more often than they change their socks, I'm sure. These boys didn't do that. They weren't wishy-washy. Remember Paul's rebuke of Peter in Galatians chapter 2. The Bible said he withstood him to his face because Peter was inconsistent. Inconsistency, I believe, is one of the great detriments to, to Christianity today. Inconsistency. You know, if you have a diamond, it's always a diamond. No matter what you do, it's always a diamond. You get a piece of glass and it can be taken back to sand, but not a, not a diamond. A diamond's always a diamond. It might be in 5,000 pieces, but it's still a diamond but not a piece of glass. If we're the real deal, we can stand it. And Peter was inconsistent. And so when the Jews were not around, he would hobnob with the Gentiles. But as soon as a Jew came around, he'd treat the Gentiles like they were trash. And he'd start hobnobbing with the Jews again. And the Bible says, Paul said, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. And of course, Barnabas was turned aside because of his inconsistency. You stop and think about your life in the past. Is there anyone today who's not serving the Lord because you were inconsistent? You preached something on Sunday and different on Monday. You, you taught them to do something. And it, if I had a child and he did, and then you got a child and he did, and you didn't, whatever it was you said you were going to do. Inconsistencies. These men were, were consistent. Inconsistency is a great threat to our society today. And if it was wrong in the Bible, it's still wrong today. Amen. Somebody says, is, is that wrong? Say, well, what, what does the Bible say? Amen. You see, it, it doesn't matter what Congress says. It, it's what the Bible says makes all the difference in the world. Listen to these verses as we close tonight. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 37 says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Amen. Not, just, not just conquerors, not just winners, but in all these things, in all the, all the struggles and all the trials and all the tragedies and, and all the violence and all the heartache and all the heartbreak and all the inconsistencies. The Bible says, nay, in all these things we are more. We're more than conquerors. Not through our energy and not through our strength and not through our great abilities, but through him that loved us, the Lord Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 57 says, But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so before we ever get victory, Paul is saying to this church, it ends up being a great church. He says, we need to be thanking God already for the victory. If we believe victory is going to come, we ought to be thanking God for the victory already. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 14 says, Now thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. You see, if Jesus isn't going to get on your team, but he sure would welcome you on to his. Amen. And we need to understand. So our choice today... We can have the Charlie Brown syndrome or we can have the Christ believed situation. We're going to just go on, you know, and why is everybody always picking on me, making up excuses for our failures, making up our excuses for our phoniness, making up our excuses for when we let down and when we quit. Or are we just going to shape up and believe what God says and Go out and catch a tiger by the tail and hold on for dear life. Somebody said, and I've, re I've referred to this several times of late here and as I visit with other people, people who want to find a way and people who don't find an excuse. Victors or victims. Which are we? Let's pray. Father, I thank you tonight that you love us and thank you, Lord, for the word of God and thank you for these young men and, Lord, for their, their boldness and their joy. 
uh, Lord, for their difference, for a marked difference in their life that just said to anyone that was looking, they're different. They have something. They have something that everyone needs. And Lord, people saw that and they recognized that. And, and uh, God, you, you just took care of them. And I believe you've done that for hundreds and thousands of others of your people through history that have done the same things these young men did. Help us, Lord, to take the Bible serious. Help us, Father, to allow you to do in us and with us and through us all that you want to do for your honor and for your glory. And we'll thank you for that in Jesus' name.